Foreign Minister Zarif, thanks very much for making the time to join us from Tehran. Well, it's good to be with you. Now, by next Tuesday evening, U.S. time, as you know, the United States could have a president-elect, although it may take longer. Everyone around the world seems to be following this election with keen interest. A lot is at stake for the U.S., of course, but a lot is also at stake for Iran, isn't it? Well, it is an important election, and uh, it will have implications uh, throughout the world. Uh, and I understand it's going to be uh, a seriously contested election, and we may not know uh, Tuesday evening your time uh, who has won, uh, but we'll see. Uh, for Iran, uh, obviously, we are following the elections, but what is important for us is uh, the behavior uh, from the White House, and unfortunately, uh, during the past uh, three and a half years. Uh, it has been a belligerent uh, behavior, uh, rejecting all norms of international law. Uh, and as long as this is uh, the, uh, the, the mood in, in the White House, uh, then there is no future. Well, you accuse them of belligerence. They accuse you of meddling in their elections. In fact, the head of U.S. intelligence, Ratcliffe, recently accused Iran and Russia of cyber interference in the election. U.S. officials say that Iran, in fact, is behind an email campaign threatening Democratic voters if they do not vote for Trump. It may sound counterintuitive that Iran would help Trump, but the U.S. is accusing you essentially of weaponizing voter data to sow chaos and undermine confidence in these elections. What is, what is your reaction well, to these accus accusations? Uh, the United States is so used to meddling in others' elections that they believe that everybody is meddling in theirs. Uh, but uh, it, it is absurd. Uh, as I said, we have no preference for the outcome of this election and certainly not for President Trump. Well, I expected you to rebut these accusations, but could some political forces in Iran see it as payback? As you say, for years of American meddling in Iran's own elections, dating back to the early 1950s, uh, 1953 and the Mossadegh election. It wasn't a meddling, it was a, a naked coup d'etat uh, which overthrew the elected government in Iran. Uh, but, but that is what we have objected to throughout these years, and we do not uh, participate in, in behavior that we have objected to ourselves. You say you don't have any preference who wins this U.S. election, but how will the outcome affect relations between Iran and the U.S. A, a new poll found that 51% of Americans see Iran as the enemy. Is a U.S.-Iran rapprochement possible with Joe Biden? Well, the United States has done a lot of harm to Iran, uh, particularly since President Trump came to office. Uh, and uh, the, it is up to the United States to undo the harm that has been done to Iran from the terroristic uh, murder uh, of a revered a military officer in, in Iran, General Soleimani, who is also revered in the region, as you saw in the demonstrations in various parts of, of the region, as well as the funeral processions for him in Iraq and, and in Iran. And also, uh, he has inflicted uh, probably close to $250 billion of damage uh, to Iranian economy over the past two, three years in violation of U.S. obligations under Security Council resolution. Uh, so uh, whoever sits in the White House has to deal with these. It doesn't matter who sits in the White House. Uh, for us, uh, the point is that they need to deal with this. We have never left the negotiating table. We are at the negotiating table with uh, the remaining members of the former P5 plus one, which is now P4 plus one. Uh, but that has to be, I mean, the United States has to gain access to this. But would you agree, though, would table. you agree, though, that there is a stark difference between Trump and Biden on Iran? Biden said he would, in fact, return to the J JCPOA, the Iran nuclear agreement that Trump pulled out of, if Tehran returns to full compliance. The Trump administration, as you point out, in fact, has imposed sanctions upon sanctions, uh, including recent sanctions on the banking sector and Iran's oil industry, which is hitting Iran's economy very hard. Iran's currency, the real, has lost, what, 56% of its value this year alone? Well, it, it is true that the United States has imposed a lot of hardship on the Iranian people. The United States has even prevented Iranian people from access to COVID-19 medicine, uh, in spite of what they're saying, which is a total lie. Uh, the United States has closed our, all our banking channels. So as far as, far as violating, uh, conducting, committing crimes against humanity, the United States has a very dark record of it. 
Uh, whether, whether Vice President Biden wants to change that policy, we will have to wait and see. We haven't seen anything. But, but I can tell you one thing. The United States, whether it's President Trump or a possible president-elect Biden, is not in a position to put conditions for Iran. Uh, JCPOA is not a revolving door. If anybody has to meet conditions, it would be the United States to regain entrance to a room where we and the rest of the members of the JCPOA are still in. But they say they want you to return to the limits of uranium enrichment that were imposed under the JCPOA. Are you willing to do that? What are your preconditions, if any? Well, we have always said that if our rights under the JCPOA are observed, and if, if the damages done to Iran are remedied, then Iran wanted to be in full compliance with the JCPOA even one year after President Trump imposed all its sanctions against Iran and withdrew illegally from the JCPOA, we remained fully compliant with the JCPOA. Then we took the avenues provided within the JCPOA. So the JCPOA, JCPOA was negotiated based on mutual mistrust. We never trusted the United States, even the previous administration, and I, I guess the United States did not trust us. So it's, it was based on mistrust. We had instruments of dealing with violations by the United States, and we exercised those instruments. We did not go beyond outside the deal. We are within the deal. So if our rights are recognized, if the uh, bad behavior is remedied, and if damages are uh, remedied, then of course. Well, it sounds like a situation of, 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 yeah. of the chicken and the eggs. What comes first? But are you willing to sit down with, well, a, new Biden, with a new Biden administration, it's not, it's not chicken, uh, Minister Zarif? It's not, chicken and the, it's not chicken and the egg. They left the JCPOA, so they need to gain uh, a ticket to re-enter the JCPOA. That's all. We are still in JCPOA. But to answer your question, Iran is fully prepared to uh, restore full compliance in the JCPOA by everybody. Does this mean reducing current uranium enrichment levels? Well, it means that fulfilling the obligations by Iran, which includes reducing current, uh, current enrichment levels. You accuse this administration of sanctions addiction. Will a new administration kick off this addiction, do you think? And in fact, this agreement that we're talking about, the JCPOA, was signed at a time when Joe Biden was vice president. If he is elected, are you ready not just to return to the negotiating table, but to sit down with your counterpart in the Biden administration, uh, a new John Kerry, to resurrect the agreement? Or is it dead and buried in many respects? No, the, the, the agreement is not dead. The agreement just... Uh basically defeated the United States in the Security Council 13 to 2. So the agreement is very much alive. Uh, while some people in, in the State Department want it dead, some people in the White House might want it dead, but the, but the agreement is very much alive. It, it is in, in intensive care. It requires urgent action by the United States uh, and by the European members of the JCPOA in order to resuscitate this agreement. Iran is prepared to do its part, but it takes a lot of effort on the part of the United States to regain uh, its place on the negotiating. Table. You say Iran is prepared to do its part, but there are also these competing political dynamics in Iran. In fact, some praised you for reaching this agreement, but others criticized you for making too many concessions. Do you have any regrets? Would you have signed the agreement if you knew that Trump would succeed Obama? And do you think that uh, the hardliners in Iran will allow you to return to the negotiating table? Well, uh, Iran is not a monolith. And we are proud of that, that we're not a monolith, that there are differences of views in Iran, and those differences are aired. But we have a process of settling those differences, and we use that process. We use that process when we agreed to JCPOA and when we committed ourselves to JCPOA, and everybody saw that the country that was most faithful to JCPOA, both during Obama administration as well as during the Trump administration, was Iran. Others violated to a... Even during Obama administration, we wrote letters to the, to the European... Uh, special representative, at that time uh, Federico Mogherini, 
to complain about the United States violating its uh, part of the deal, to complain about the E3, the European three, UK, uh, France, and Germany violating their part of the deal. So, uh, but, but we remain faithful. You have t the United States has tested us, and the United States and the rest of the world have seen that when Iran makes a commitment, we remain true to our commitment. It is, in fact, the United States that has to prove itself. And it is, in fact, the E3, the Europeans, who have to prove themselves, who have not been able to do anything because of the US pressure. But, but given the situation uh, uh, as it is, even if Iran did stick to the deal and, and fulfill its part of the bargain, the situation has evolved. If Trump is re-elected, will Iran have to negotiate Given the serious impact the sweeping sanctions have had on, on the economy, the, the Islamic Parliament Research Center in Iran has reported that capital flights have amounted to tens of billions of dollars. To say the least, the economy is in dire straits, not to mention the most recent effects of the pandemic, which has also affected Iran very severely. And, and according to some other data out of Iran, 70% of the population could fall below the poverty line, close to 60 million people, if the situation doesn't change. Uh, will you have to change direction? No, it's the US that needs to have to, uh, to change direction, not, not Iran. You see, let me, let me just ask you, not ask you, just explain to you what is happening. If Iran allows an agreement that was negotiated with seven partners to be renegotiated just because one or few of them don't like the outcome of the negotiations, then there won't be any end to it. If you allow a bully to bully you by imposing economic pressure, then the next morning he'll wake up with another demand and he'll ask for another concession. And that would be unending. What we have suffered is because of the United States' inability to accept its responsibility. And the long-term impact of that inability is that no one in the world trusts the word of the United States. Now, it's not just the JCPOA. They violated INF. They violated the, the Paris Accord. They withdrew from NAFTA. They withdrew from uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Just, just name it. They withdrew from UNESCO. They withdrew from Human Rights Council. They withdrew from but, any But where place. does it leave I mean, you, though? Where does it leave Iran? Maybe they want to withdraw from the White House. I don't <laughs> but know. But where does it leave you? Has Iran turned its back uh, on Europe and on the United States? Is it now embracing China in the East? I know you recently signed a 25-year strategic cooperation agreement with China. Is it fair to say that you've given up on the U.S.? and Europe? Or does it depend, again, on what happens uh, uh, in the elections? Well, it depends on the behavior uh, of the United States. We have never turned our back to Europe. We are always open to cooperating with Europe. We have always been eager to cooperate with China and Russia and with Asia. Uh, we have continued that policy. And that, that policy is a very fundamental part of Iranian foreign policy, that we will not rely on one or another party. We will have our own independent foreign policy, and we will deal with anybody who is prepared to deal with us based on uh, equal standing and equal footing. We saw recently a certain victory for Iran in the UN Security Council. The Trump administration failed to extend a 13-year UN arms embargo, which expired last Sunday. But the US is now threatening any country which would sell Iran military hardware. I know Iran has developed its own missile technology, and ballistic missile technology uh, could be put on the table by the United States, even by Biden administration. Is this negotiable for you, or is it a red line for Iran? Nothing that we have already negotiated is, can be the subject of renegotiation. That's final. We will not renegotiate a deal for which we spent 10 years of negotiations and two years of very intensive negotiations. I mean, this saying that the United States, the people in the US say, what's mine is mine and what's yours is negotiable, 
does not apply to Iran. Let me ask you about ours is Let me ask you about the recent normalization of relations between the EU, UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, and Israel. It's widely seen as a, a consolidation of a growing anti-Iran front in the region, with Saudi Arabia very much in the shadows. Could these new geopolitical alliances lead to a new arms race in the region, greater tensions, particularly if Trump remains in the White House? And does it further isolate Iran within its own region? Well, uh, as far as I know, uh, nothing new has happened between the UAE and Bahrain and Saudi Arabia with Israel. They've had long-standing relations. Uh, now they're, they're saying 15 years of uh, intelligence cooperation, active cooperation, uh, certainly on Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel and the UAE have been cooperating since uh, John Kerry and I were negotiating uh, the nuclear deal. I, I remember uh, from those days how much uh, trouble they caused for the United States in the negotiations, how much interference they had together. Open. Uh, it's been formalized. So, I mean, it's, it's showing a shift yeah, in dynamics. Uh, the the part the, the the countries that are being alienated are those who are turning their back against the cause which has united the Arab and Islamic world for the past 70 years, and that's the cause of Palestine. I think those are alienated. We are in the mainstream of the Islamic world. Those are the outcasts in the Islamic world which have decided to simply stab the Palestinians in the back. We uh, spoke at the beginning uh, about the U.S. elections. Let me ask you about uh, Iranians also going to the polls next year to elect a new president in just a few months. Would the election of a, a hardliner, quote unquote, possibly even a member of the Revolutionary Guard, close the door to any prospect of a rapprochement with Washington and uh, any other uh, European capitals? Well, I think uh, the, the elections in Iran uh, will show uh, the approach of Iranian people to many issues, including foreign policy. And whoever is elected gets the mandate from the people based on the platform that they present. Now, uh, a lot of people are gearing up to participate in that election, uh, but we do not know the platforms yet. So let's wait and see. Uh, we will know by the time the election uh, is held where the people are standing, where the people of Iran stand and who they will vote for, for the election. But would you say that the reformists have lost their electoral base? Has their position been weakened compared to the hardliners who have long viewed the U.S. with suspicion? Yeah, the last parliamentary election uh, basically uh, moved in that direction, but things uh, have the capability of of, of changing in Iran. The, the, the populist vote based on the platforms presented by, by the various candidates, and we are still six, seven months away from the elections. But, but the point is that it is the behavior of the United States and the West which has uh, shown to, to the Iranian people that they cannot be trusted. And I think that's a very bad message that they have sent. And just finally, uh, Foreign Minister Zarif, if you had to make one prediction looking ahead, uh, looking at U.S.-Iran relations, what would it be? Well, uh, I, I do not make predictions, but I believe the United States has basically uh, used every instrument of pressure that it could have used uh, against Iran uh, and basically, there is nothing left uh, of their addiction to sanctions. Uh, so, as I suggested the other day, they need to kick the habit. All right. Foreign Minister Javad Zarif, thank you very much indeed for joining us. A pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. It was good to be with you.